I don't know if you've seen this in my home or not. It's a cross. It's three crosses. Let me read to you what it says on the back. One day before Easter, a young man asked his mom, what craft could I do to, for this season? She told him to think about what it meant to him. He came back to her with this cross saying, Mom, look, it's three crosses of Calvary. The one that is vacant in the middle, he said, didn't go with Christ. The one attached to the top did. The young man is quite blessed by the Lord. From birth, he was not expected to live. And in school, he was told he had a learning disability. God has called him to share his love through this message in the design of this three crosses of Calvary. And this was created by a young man, age 14, Brandon Levins. And this was up there in the Panhandle area, in the area of Dumas, Texas, where this cross was made. Bearing that in mind, you might want to vision that as we go through this evening's lessons. You know, this is the Memorial Day for our Lord. You know, we have an annual day that honors fallen soldiers. This includes all the soldiers of all wars. Yankees and rebels, as well as those who died for the Republic of Texas at San Jacinto and the Alamo. Those who have died in all battles all over the world. They did so that we might live free. You know, this should be an honor to us and an honor to those that fought and have fallen for our freedom. Look at John 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus said that. Those are the words of Christ. How many Americans are forsaking the honor of their fallen commander-in-chief? The commander-in-chief of our Lord's army fell in battle in AD 33, and he commanded us to remember him on this day weekly. That's W-E-E-K-L-Y, not as our countrymen do, W-E-A-K-L-Y, very weakly. Our commander-in-chief He's our prophet, our priest, our king. He fell in battle that we might have eternal life and freedom from the burdens of our own sins. That's why cross died, uh, Christ died. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem on Golgotha, if you prefer Calvary. Matthew 27, verse 33 through 35, and Luke 23, 33. You know, two other men, <clears throat> not soldiers of the Lord's army, were led to that place of execution along with Jesus. Two other men. There were also two criminals led with him to be put to death. That's who they were, criminals, those two men. Notice the comma before and after the words criminals so that you don't misunderstand Luke's intent. His intent was to set Jesus apart from these common criminals. All three were crucified, one thief on one side of Jesus, and Jesus was in the middle cross. Luke 23, verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, comma, and the criminals, comma, one on the right hand 
and the other on the left hand. Jesus is set apart from those criminals. One thief on his cross represented rebellion and arrogance. The scene depicted is impenitent, lost humanity. That's what the one individual was. This one thief scoffed at Christ. He blasphemed his name. Blasphemo is the word in Latin that's used. Luke 23, verse 39. Then one of the criminals who was hanging blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us too. Notice the terms of his condition for salvation. If you're the Christ, save yourself and us too. Luke 23, verse 39. Blasphemy is to speak of the supreme being in terms that are impious and irreverent, to revile or to speak reproachfully of God or of the Holy Spirit, any one of the supreme deities. His scorn... His arrogant rebellion for the Messiah was greater than the excruciating physical pain that he was trying to endure. You've probably heard of hateful people when they lash out at other people in times of pain. They want to take it out on someone other than themselves. And yet, Jesus had done nothing to arouse his malicious sarcasm. His blasphemy. Jesus was sinless. The statement of the thief indicated that he was rebellious and arrogant and impenitent and that he cared so little about his own soul even though he was about to cross the threshold of death. He did not care about his own soul. This malicious benefactor Mal benefactor, you might call him, represents a whole host of lost souls. Most of the world. One million or more souls have crossed the threshold of eternity with no or little concern for their souls either. They too are forever lost. You know, you might even increase that number to billions. I don't know how many people have ever inhabited this earth. Many souls around us live outside even the basic standards of human righteousness. And that is far less than God's righteousness. Less stringent than God's standards of righteousness. And they still can't come to Christ. They rebel against civil authority. And they are often openly without either remorse or penitence when they get caught and when they're punished. Some sinners even profess that they do not want to go to heaven. And they do not desire the companionship of godly people even in this life. Much less than an eternal life. And I'm sure that they will get what they profess. The same thief also represents a great number of souls who do not truly believe and have not obeyed him. They are lost, lost souls, every one of them. The thief was an unbeliever. He was interested only in salvation on his own terms. Similar, even since lost souls today want to be saved on their own terms, or the denominational terms that they're being taught. What did the thief say? If you can, if you can save yourself, come on down, you can save us too. On his terms, not on Christ's terms. Further, the thief was a highly skeptical individual. And he would have tested the Lord, desiring a sign from him. Yeah, come on down. Save us. Save yourself. People are no different today. Despite that fact, the Lord has already validated himself as a Savior. Through the miracles he performed when we didn't have the written word of God. When you look at uh, Mark 16 verse 20. 
And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And you know the thief saw that. He had to have. <coughs> the second thief on the cross represented penitence. And he depicted the only attitude through which souls can be saved. <coughs> the speech of the second thief acknowledged Jesus as the Christ. Luke 23, verses 40 through 43. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing, nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's an entirely different attitude, isn't it? Evidently, the earthly ministry of Jesus was publicly known. People knew why he was there. And so did this thief. This thief recognized Jesus as God, Theos, deity. Luke 23, verse 40. But the other answering him rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? He also admitted that he and the other thief were guilty. They were guilty of their crimes, whereas Jesus was innocent in verse 41. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing. This man has done nothing wrong. So this thief believed Jesus to be the Messiah our Savior, who was to establish the long prophesied kingdom. The second thief believed strong enough to trust his eternity to the man on the middle cross, which was more faith than even the apostles were exhibiting at that time. They didn't even want to know Christ or recognize him, did they? They went into hiding. This thief was out in the open saying, this is Christ. This thief not only believed, but he repented of his sins. He appealed for the salvation that only the Savior of this world would ever know. As Jesus saved that thief on the cross by the terms applicable to that thief's time, you have to remember the New Testament was not yet in effect, according to Hebrews 9, verses 16 and 7. So must souls now living turn to Jesus for salvation, according to his present and applicable terms. Those terms presented in the gospel. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greeks. Romans 1 verse 16. The forgiveness of sins did not <clears throat> and does not negate the consequences of sin. The thief was still punished for his crimes and rightfully so. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinances of God. And those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. Romans 13, verse 2. Each and every one of us comes under the law of the land. The penitent thief rebuked his sinful cohort and defended Christ. Followers of our Lord are to oppose unrighteousness, according to 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, and James 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, followers of our Lord further defend righteousness. Do you remember what it says in Jude verse 3? Behold, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once delivered to all the saints. We must always contend for the faith. That's the reason Christ died, so we can have that faith and that salvation. Penitent souls, uh, they need to turn in their heart and in their conduct from their former sins and their evil associations, according to 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18. <clears throat> what about the guy on the middle cross? <coughs> The middle cross was viewed from a con contrasting perspective. The impenitent thief saw a man evil like himself as an imposter for a savior. The penitent thief on the middle saw the middle Christ, the man as the son of God, man's only savior. So he had the correct view, didn't he? The, the penitent thief did. Jesus suffered vicariously, meaning in the place of another. The thieves died for themselves, whereas Jesus died for the sins of all other people in the world. <clears throat> for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus' death on the middle cross was also the fulfillment of a prophecy. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 12. The sacrificial blood of Christ is what saves our souls. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 1, verse 7. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all who would be saved. And they must turn to Him for that salvation. It's the only place where we can find salvation. His mission here was to save the lost. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, verse 10. Jesus is here to save the faithful. Therefore I say to you, you will die in your sins. If you do not believe I am He, you will die in your sins. <clears throat> Jesus further requires repentance and public confession that He is the Christ. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Therefore whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is laying down his plan of salvation, isn't he? Souls who desire salvation must obey Jesus. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? It's a good question, isn't it? Jesus adds the saved to his church. Acts 2, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we know how to get into the church, don't we? So what's the conclusion of today's lesson? What application? Impenitent sinners are lost and will remain lost until they repent. And follow Christ's plan of salvation. Penitent sinners need to obey the gospel plan of salvation. The road to salvation begins with a statement, I have sinned. As we see in Nehemiah 1 through 6. Well, chapter 1, verse 6. Please, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. 
that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. The blood of Jesus is the propitiation for sin. This allows God's grace to save mankind. That's what it tells us in Romans 3, verses 23 through 25. Reading verse 24 through 25, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that He is, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Romans 3 verses 24 and 25. So does your speech and your conduct nearly identify with the impenitent thief or with the penitent thief? Are you impenitent or are you penitent? You know, how you react to the middle cross will affect you in this life and it will determine where you spend your eternity in the next life. How do you react to that? What are you doing about it? If you're an unbaptized believer, you need to put Jesus on in baptism and thereby have your sins washed away. Galatians 3 verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you're an erring child of God and you need to come back to the Lord and Savior today, there is a way for you. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to repent and pray to God for that forgiveness. We want to offer you the opportunity to do those things now while we stand and sing.